Hello students, uh, today from paper 104, uh, uh, we will be discussing the topic on international trade theory, classical, neoclassical and Marxist perspective, critical review, globalization and changing structure and composition of international trade, CAT and WTO. So beginning with about the international trade theory. Uh, now trade is a concept of exchanging goods and services between two people or entities so trade is a very common concept uh, so when there are international trade theories it basically means the different theories to explain the flow of international trade now here there are certain perspective given uh, by economists who have developed theories to explain the mechanism of global trade uh, the main historical theories are being called classical and are from the perspective of country or country based so by the mid 20th century the theories began to shift to explain trade from a firm rather than a country's perspective and these theories are referred to as modern and are firm based or company based both these categories of classical and the modern consisting several international theories are being explained so the classical and neoclassical perspective includes the classical political economic as well as the neoclassical theory which embraces the free trade so this is because the theory of comparative advantage the first developed by david ricardo so ricardo's theory says that free trade is advantageous as it allows nations to specialize in production that require relatively fewer factor inputs this reasoning is based on the concept of opportunity cost and postulates that even nations that are worse in producing any good stand to gain something from the trade over here. So the main focus uh, over here was related to free trade and the competitive ad advantage which was put forward by David Ricardo. Then Hector and Olin's theory, uh, in this theory, uh, it says that the countries will tend to export goods that require more inputs from a production factor, that is capital, land, labor. They have an abundance and vice versa, import goods that require more input for production factor, that is scarce. So also due to trade, both the prices of goods as well as returns to production factors will reach an equilibrium or a world price. Uh, then talking about the insti institutionalist, the institutionalist have more ambiguous stance about the free trade. Uh, this is mainly because they embrace a more active role for state management of economic development and fear that opening up national economies to world trade too soon might interfere into those plans over here. So your federate list in particular emphasis the nation as a locus of collective identity. Uh, consequently, the national indicators like, for example, the balance of payments, the share of manufacturing or any other nationally relevant industry or the exchange rate of the nation's currency would become more important issues than consumers' welfare needs. So he here focused about the nation's uh, aspect related to the trade over here then taking into consideration the uh, Marx, marxist perspective over here so marx has a critical approach towards the other theories that were put forward so the marx stressed the necessity of international trade for the for the sake of capital accumulation in his analysis the other workings in the Marxian the uh, tradition, such as Karl Gotze, Rosa Luxemburg, J. Hob Hobson, and V. E. Lenin, subsequently developed theories of imperialism, whereby the conquest of new markets was a function of capitalist mode of production in the industrialized economies. Uh, then, consequently, the capital needed to expand ruthlessly and violently to realize its surplus value, and therefore, bring all parts of the world is not yet subjected to capitalist production under its aegis. It is noteworthy that free trade here is seen as a zero sum game where value is transferred from the powerless to the powerful often under the use of physical force that is in the form of colonial armies, foreign backed dictators or economic and financial pressure. 
here the focus is more on capitalism and imperialism and moving further and discussing about the globalization and changing structure and composition of international trade so it is been seen that the global economy uh, in the global economy no nation is self sufficient uh, which is associated that there is a specific flow of goods people and information so definitely the trade is definitely taking place over here in this globalized world so each nation is involved in different levels in trade to sell what it produces to acquire what it lacks and to produce more efficiently in some economic sectors than its trade partners uh it can be seen that 80% of the global trade takes place within value chains managed by multinational companies multinational corporations that is the mncs and their global trade is uh, reaching to higher levels mainly due to uh, the marketing that is done in today's time the international trade has also therefore grown very fast due to these multinational corporations the structure of global trade flows have shifted, shifted with many developing economies having growing more participation in the international trade with an increasing share of manufacturing so earlier it was the focus was mainly only on the de developed economies benefiting from the trade but now definitely the developing economies in this global world are also benefiting because they have also increased their share in the manufacturing process now if we see the trend it is seen that uh, since the 1950s uh the involved relative decline in bulk liquids such as oil and more dry bulk and general cargo is been created so there is a shift also in terms of developed economies to developing economies as well as there is there is also a shift in the type of products which are also traded another emerging trade flow concerns is the increase in the imports of resources from developing economies namely energy commodities and agriculture products which is a divergence from their conventional role as exporters of resources so uh, it can be seen how the globalization uh, has taken shape with the in the 1021st century with the help of these silent trends what are these four trends we will understand so it it has been seen that since 1980 to 2015 the value of exports have grown by a factor of 9 times if measured in current dollars while gdp has increased 6 times and the population increased at 1.6 times definitely so since 2010 the international trade appears to be leveling over here so we can see there is a high increase you can say in terms of exports and the countries benefiting from the trade a substantial level of containerization of commercial flows with container throughout growing in proportion with the global trade over here then there is a high higher relative growth of trade of emerging economies particularly in pacific asia that focuses on export oriented development strategies that have been associated with imbalance in within the commercial relations so basically the developing economies especially from pacific asia are exporting and participating in the trade the growing role of multinational corporations as vectors for international trade particularly in terms of share of international trade is taking place over here so as it is been seen there is a shift in the role of mncs and in this the globalization is changing with time now further we can understand the role of uh, the general agreement of trades and tariffs and the world trade organization and their specific role in the international trade so uh, the general agreement on trade and tariffs is a legal agreement between many countries whose overall purpose was to promote the international trade by reducing or eliminating trade barriers such as the tariffs for so it was initially formed to remove the trade barriers especially the tariff so according to the preamble uh, the purpose of general agreement on trade and tariff is substantial reduction of tariffs and other trade barriers and the elimination of preferences on a reciprocal and mutually advantageous basis 
uh, now here uh, it is a multinational trade treaty now when we first talk about the gat it was first discussed during the united nations conference on trade and employment and was the outcome of the failure of negotiating government to create the international trade organization so 23 countries signed the final act of general agreement on tariffs and trade on 30th october 1947 after a period of intensive negotiations uh, then it had been updated in a series of global trade negotiations consisting nine rounds since 1947 up till 1995 so the role of international trade was largely to succeed in 1995 by the formation of the world trade organization so basically gat and its successor wto has succeeded in reducing the tariffs over here the average tariff level for the major gat participants were about 22% in 1947 but it is 5% after the uruguay round in 1999 so exports attribute a part of tariff change to Uh, GATT and WTO. So definitely, GATT and WTO have have played an important role in the reductions of the trade tariffs. Uh, apart from this, in addition, uh, in addition to facilitating the applied tariff reductions, the early GATT's contribution to trade liberalisation includes the binding of negotiated tariff reduction. for an extended period establishing the generality of non discrimination through most favored nations that is the mfn treatment and national treatment status ensuring increased transparency of trade policy measures and providing a forum for future negotiations and peaceful resolutions of bilateral disputes so all of these elements contributed to the rationalization of trade policy and the reduction of trade barriers and policy uncertainty it is seen that gat has provisions of special and differential treatment which exempts developing countries from same strict trade rules and disciplines of most industrialized countries when talking about the world trade organization The World Trade Organization is the only global international organization dealing with the rules of trade between nations. So it has over 164 members representing 98% of the world. Uh, the headquarters of the WTO is situated at Geneva, which is in Switzerland, uh, and the goal is to ensure that trade flows as smoothly, predictably, and freely as possible. and it is an organization for trade opening the wto is a, is basically run by the member governments and all major decisions are made by the membership as a whole either by the ministers who are usually who usually meet once in a uh, once every two years or by ambassadors or delegates who meet regularly in geneva the wto persecutes persecutes general agreement on trades and tariffs GATT was established by the multilateral treaty of 23 countries as discussed earlier in 1947 after the world war 2 and the WTO's creation was on 1st January 1995 which marked the biggest reform in the international trade since the end of the second world war uh, whereas the GATT mainly dealt with trade in goods the WTO is in agreements also covered trade in services and intellectual property Uh, the birth of wto also created new procedures for settlement of disputes so if there are disputes related to uh, trade agreements that is also resolved by the wto the wto agreement covers goods services and intellectual property they spell out principles of liberalization and permitted exceptions they include the individual country's commitment to lower custom tariffs and other trade barriers and to open and keep service markets they also set procedures for settling disputes uh, the agreements require government to make their trade policies transparent by notifying wto about laws in force and measures adopted so various wto councils and committees seek to ensure that these requirements are being followed and that wto agreements are being properly implemented also the wto's procedure 
for resolving trade quarrels under dispute settlement understanding is vital for enforcing the rules and therefore for ensuring the trade flows smoothly even the countries bring disputes to the wto if they think their rights under the agreements are being infringed the judgments by specially appointed independent experts are based on interpretations of agreements and individual countries commitment so wto agreements contain special provisions for developing countries including longer periods to implement agreements and commitments then measures to increase their trading opportunities and to support help them build their trade capacity handle disputes and to implement technical standards the wto organizes hundreds of technical cooperation mission to developing countries annually uh we can say that over the past 25 years the wto members have agreed on major updates of wto rule book to improve the flow of global trade uh in 19, in 2015 the wto reached significant milestone of the receipt received of 500 trade dispute for settlement and in 2020 the wto marks it 25th anniversary Uh, so with this we come to the end of this topic thank you so much